Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Straits Times Through the Lens webinar on photojournalism. I'm Dylan Ang. It will come as no surprise that when history books about 2020 are written, the COVID-19 pandemic would be the number one thing mentioned. This and others are some of memorable images of 2020, which will be featured at the National Museum of Singapore at Through the Lens, a photography exhibition jointly organised by The Straits Times and World Press Photo. It will run until the 7th of February and admission is free. Now on that note, we'd like to thank our venue supporter, National Museum of Singapore, outreach partner, Singapore Press Club and logistics partner, Trinity Cargo Link. Now, if 2020 was a year of change, how was it like documenting a new normal amid the pandemic? We're joined today by four photojournalists from The Straits Times to discuss their coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic in Singapore, the role photojournalism plays during a public health crisis and some of the notable challenges that they faced. Please join me in welcoming my colleagues Neil Xiaopin, Kevin Lim, Mark Cheong and Benjamin Sito. Welcome guys to the webinar and uh, here's how it's going to work. The four photojournalists will take turns to present their work showcase at the Through the Lens exhibition and then we will have a Q&A session at the end where you can ask them any questions you may have. It can be simple ones or maybe even complex ones or maybe even technical ones. Now feel free to use Zoom's Q&A function and type your questions there and we'll get to it at the end. Guys, are you ready? Let's get this started. Now, Xiaopin, you know, let's uh, let get the ball rolling with you. Now, a bit of an introduction to Xiaopin. Uh, she's been with The Straits Times since 2010 and now manages Home in Focus, a weekly series of photography features produced by SD's Photodesk, uh, documenting different facets of ever-changing Singapore. Now, her work has also garnered regional awards from One IFRA Asia Media Awards and Asia Digital Media Awards, to name a few, and in 2014 was awarded one of Singapore's most prestigious photography accolades, the icon D. Martel Cotton Blue. Now, Xiaopin, now talk us through the role that photojournalism plays during a public health crisis? So basically as photojournalists, we are the eyes and the ears on the ground. Uh, we evaluate situations and then we make pictures. Mm. Uh, we document the, the happenings of this lifetime, which is why it's important for us to do what we do. Um, the virus has challenged reporters covering their stories um, to find new ways to do their work while staying safe. Mm -hmm. So the images that you are currently seeing here are tear sheets from the work that with the picture desk has done over the past year uh, that's uh, on like uh, COVID related features, photo features. Um, and then basically, um, so while reporters have to find new ways, right, for, for photographers, mm -hmm. whether it's we are doing stills or videos, it's much more difficult to do our work from a distance, it's, it's virtually impossible yeah. and there's no way. So um, mainly because photography often requires a connection between the one with the camera and our subjects. Um, and then a personal connection needs closeness and time uh, to develop. And then um, what's important is I think that photojournalists put a human face um, to the news that you're seeing unfold. Um, it is so necessary that photographers are out there and doing this. And then covering this pandemic has been important, but it has also presented challenges such as like gaining access to centres of activity uh, and then continuing with daily reportage, but keeping in mind social responsibility and that the same restrictions that apply to public for everyone also applies to photojournalists right. on the ground, among other things. Mm. So, yeah. And then it's been a year and after a year, the fight is still on, it's not over. Uh, we are still in the midst of a battle. And I guess the, like, the main difference is like in war, you don't bring the enemy home with you. Mm. But um, while c covering a pandemic, you can, and then um, it can kill indiscriminately. Mm. Mm. During pre-COVID times, um, the, st uh, the picture desk actually covers anything from sports, news, um, sp um, both locally and overseas. But obviously overseas is out of the picture now. Mm. Uh, and then this pandemic has made everyone actually look inwards which is not necessarily a bad thing in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, we get to see Singapore and like um, in a different light in a way and then look at how uh, our focus basically on, on us. Mm. Yeah, the picture desk actually runs uh, Home in Focus, uh, which focuses on photo features on the local community, um, people, places and issues. So in the past year, uh, we've tried our best to show readers our country's visual narrative uh, on our war against the pandemic. Yeah, 
and then whether it's like the frontline battle um, to migrant workers, the issues from in the dorms, to how basically COVID-19 has uh, impacted everyone's daily lives, you know, really daily lives, like mm. from sports to things that you do, like online. Every fest, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm just going to zoom in on um, the very early stage of the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, and w maybe share a little bit of what my experience wa was like. So for me, I was at Singapore General Hospital uh, early March last year. So to put things into context, right, this was actually before Circuit Breaker. Wow. Yeah, and then like if you think about it, like you know now we are looking at like like thousands and thousands of Case cases, numbers, right? Yeah. But back then when the story was out, it was just 226 cases. Mm. We had no deaths yet. Um, and then um, why SGH? You know, it was um, Singapore's. It had Singapore's case number one, basically, uh, the 66-year-old Chinese man from mm. Wuhan. So, um, and then. I think the main thing is that covering assignments related to a highly infectious virus is not really the same as like you know what we are used to daily, which is like crime, maybe news, mm. or like uh, yeah green, green stuff. You know, um, there are actually really strict infection protocols that you have to uh, adhere to. So um, I actually intend basically before you go into a hospital in an infectious zone, you have to attend mass fittings and training for donning and doffing of personal protective equipment, we call them PPEs, for different hospitals that I, I went into, which is what frontline staff have to go to mm -hmm. through. I mean, it's to protect ourselves, protect the people that we are dealing with also. So I'll always be thankful that um, as GH opened their doors and they trusted us enough to give us access to enable us to have a first look inside the hospital during the early stage of the pandemic and to let the public know what was happening on behind behind the scenes on mm -hmm. the front line yeah. uh, which is not just actually healthcare workers also but but for everyone from logistics to cleaners to contact tracers you know it's like uh, it's everyone involved mm -hmm. yeah um, i was able to see how nurses cared for suspected uh, covid cases uh, at isolation ward 68 um, isolation ward basically has single negative pressure rooms that they are purpose-built to handle patients with infectious disease. Mm. Um, I was at the emergency department handling suspect cases. So back then, actually, the ambulatory surgery uh, center for day surgery at SGH was uh, that was adjacent to their emergency department was converted to an extension for fever area to handle suspect cases. Mm. Yeah, with symptoms lah. Yeah, and then. Um, this, the next photo is actually um, it's on display at the exhibition. Um, this showed the transfer uh, of a suspect case from SGH to the National Heart Center for an emergency scan. So, I mean, usually procedures, they try as much as possible to be done in the isolation ward because they, they aim to minimize transfers in and out. Yeah. yeah, and then, but if transfers are necessary, then it actually is done. It's quite a big logistics effort. It's like with the help of security team to keep public away, mm -hmm. and then medical staff in full PPE. You know, yeah. So I was also at like uh, the labs. So you look at processing of swabs and specimens at its molecular laboratory, mm -hmm. and then the thing is the lab, lab is actually locked down. As in, so when they start processing, you have this alarm, and then it goes on into lockdown, which um, during processing of the samples which are suspected so that like in case of any leak kind of thing nothing gets out mm. and then I was at the ops room with the contact tracers uh, who pe perform initial contact tracing before like the information they gather is actually handed to MOH yeah so and then the ministry will expand their work within the community mm. and then it's quite crazy to see contact tracers like at work la, because like you cannot I mean when you're on there then you cannot imagine the amount of information and the things that they have to go through receipts and stuff like that mm. so I think when I first started doing this it was a very conscious effort to like keep track of my own whereabouts <laughs> I was thinking if the contract tracer actually came to me yeah. then at least I have the info to give it mm. to them give to them yep um, and then I was also at the diagnostic imaging of, uh, sus of suspect cases um, for their CT scans. Mm. So actually, like, it's also a big logistic thing, you know, from the transfer to the, uh, the X-ray, MRI th for the scans. Mm. Um, the contact points, they will be wrapped in plastic and then they will be discarded after the scan. And then the whole room, scanners and everything will undergo this thorough wipe down. Mm. Uh, and then UV in, uh, disinfection. Yeah, and then like I say, it's not just frontline. Also, you're looking at cleaners and um, daily common areas disinfection, 
and then how like back then the cleaning frequency just basically went up from two times to five times a day mm. and then I guess the cleaners were super busy yeah, yeah it's big, crazy very big change yeah and the us usage of sanitizers actually increased like 2.5 times back then yeah and then it had to be replenished like regularly during like you know um, inspection mm. frequency yeah so I guess like the back then we were looking at a stigma for healthcare workers like uh, you know a, a year ago it was that was the case you know nurses were talking about how taxi taxi uncles don't really want to drive them around yeah, yeah and then um, it's not just for healthcare workers but also the ones who are infected as well there was this fear of being ostracized um, I, I guess there will always be a fear of the unknown yeah and it's always tricky and like a provoking when you're dealing with something that you are not outright that's not outrightly visible you cannot see you know it's up to us as photojournalists actually to make sense of it in our photos and basically put a face to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, to make it a bit more, um, like you said, like put a face to it. Because yeah. if not, it's like an invisible virus. Yeah, there's, a, there's a difference when you're reading about it in text and then you're looking at it in mm. photos, you know, yeah. you see what's happening. Mm. Yeah, for I sure. think there's a connection there. Well, thanks so much uh, for that, Xiaobin. Uh, that was a very, uh, I, think, uh, I think our audiences would appreciate appreciated that. I mean, I, a lot of pictures I saw were very, you know, very behind the scenes things that you really wouldn't see in the hospital, you know. So uh, I think that was, you know, that was uh, really something that is, uh, I, our audiences would really love to see. Yeah. Now, okay, now let's move on to Kevin. Now, Kevin, um, before you talk us through, you know, the... Uh, foreign worker uh, dormitories. Um, a bit of an introduction to Kevin, of course. He is an executive photographer at The Straits Times. And among his highlights, uh, covering Typhoon uh, Haiyan's aftermath in 2013, the Air Asia disaster, as well as the 2018 Trump Kim Summit. Uh, in fact, his coverage was featured in Time, The Daily Telegraph, NBC, and many other leading media outlets. Now, Kevin, it's your turn now. You know, at the height of COVID-19 infections in Singapore, you know, the spotlight was suddenly thrust uh, onto uh, foreign worker dormitories. You know, tell us about that. All right. Thank you, Dylan. I mean, indeed, even uh, even though Case 42, um, this 39-year-old um, Raju from um, Bangladesh, was mm. the first migrant worker to be hospitalised due to COVID-19 in early February last year. Um, it wasn't until April that we saw the full extent of how the virus incapacitated our migrant workforce. Mm. So COVID-19 found its way in, into the tight communal spaces of dormitories, housing um, migrant workers. And from there, the cases, you know, they swelled from about 1,000 to more than 15,000 in less yeah. than a month. So it became, uh, I mean, it was absolutely necessary for us to um, gain access into a hospital so that we may um, find a way to document what our migrant workers are going through. Um, we always had a healthy re relationship with um, Ng Teng Fong General Hospital and one that's built on trust. So after some discussions, we were granted exclusive access. But gaining access was only half the battle won. Um, the other half is staying out of the virus reach. Our pictures um, that you see, w whether at, at the exhibition or shown on this webinar, were from the hospitals were, taking, um, were, were taken behind full PPE, complete with um, gloves and goggles. But our main challenge then was to keep our presence of mind and still be able to catch moments as they unfold while um, we are behind foggy goggles and uh, PPE drained from our own sweat. Mm. And thus, we had to be very disciplined and we ad adhered to um, recommended practices uh, like not removing our goggles when inside potentially uh, contagious zones yes, in a yeah. hospital. Um, it's, it's really about being a responsible human being at the end of the day, um, being answerable to our loved ones and being able to stay healthy so that we can continue our work. Which brings me to, to, to the next point. So, and, and disinfecting of equipment was a must for, for it was constantly exposed to the virus. Um, the pandemic was turning into a marathon and we had to make sure that we, as well as our equipment, can last the distance. So on the ground, I saw the effects of a pandemic at play with my own eyes. Um, droves of migrant workers with anxiety written on their faces, they all came to register themselves at a common area that was converted to triage uh, incoming cases. And then they would then proceed to a um, swabbing station. Mm. And there, I saw that some of them, actually, they, they actually sh shed tears. 
Um, but those tears, uh, it's not entirely of sorrow, were actually a natural reaction caused by discomfort to nerve endings at the back of the nose and uh, throat mm. during the swab test. And for those who exhibited discomfort in, in the lungs, um, x-rays were taken. Yeah. And uh, after this, this, um, this series of tests, they then proceeded to, um, a, to a wait that, that could um, take up to six hours. Mm. And that's in the community hall in Jurong Community Hospital, which is actually adjacent to and um, operating in tandem with Ng Teng Fong General Hospital during that period. Um, and that's where migrant workers, you know, um, we, I, I, I could see them being laid on stretchers, uh, I mean stretcher beds. And you could, you could observe that openings of the, um, the hall were actually sealed to prevent contamination. Yeah. From time to time, you can also see a doctor walking in and then he'll then squat down next to a patient to break the news of a positive test, a positive test results. Yeah. And that, that period of time was also pretty busy because it was um, the fasting month. Mm. So it, it was a difficult period for, for the Bangladeshi workers yeah. as well as um, for the, um, the hospital staff. Know, because they, they, they need to conduct their daily pr prayers as well. Yeah. So moving on, for those um, who are, who's gotten a positive test, they were then um, moved to the, the wards. Mm. Um, normal, there were previously normal wards at uh, Ng Teng Fong um, General Hospital. They're then converted to cohort wards to house these um, mi migrant workers who's tested positive for COVID-19. And that was also necessary because uh, they had to increase their, their capacity, which, which was why the normal wards were then converted to become cohort wards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in, with regards to our migrant workers, you know, with, uh, I mean, taking picture after picture, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that while they are here to make a living, mm -hmm. they're also fathers and sons of family members who hold them in high re regard. Yeah. And our healthcare workers, they had to change in and out of stuffy PPEs, mm. you know, foggy goggles upon entering and exiting every single zone. Yeah. Yeah, so it was a very dedicated um, process that they, they needed to ad adhere to. And also because their lives depended on it. Yeah. Because at the same time, really, many others were also dependent on these frontline workers for their own lives. Yeah. So. We also entered the um, intensive care units, right? And when, when you're inside, you actually see that you know, it's a battle to, it's really a battle to increase the odds of patients walking out of those doors, you know, be it to um, community care facilities or hopefully, you know, and eventually back to their families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But through it all, I, I realized that we are all in the same fight. Um, be it a healthcare worker on, on in the front line, uh, a migrant worker fighting for his life, or even a representative of the media who's there covering the pandemic, you know. I mean, or even that, that person who's keeping a safe distance from you. Yeah, we are, we are all in the same fight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, for your sharing. Now, uh, just a quick reminder to all the, our audiences who's watching us, you know, we'll have a Q&A session at the end, so do note down all your questions for our four panellists over here. Now, let's move on now to Mark. Um, now, Mark, um, you know, Mark's an executive photographer at The Straits Times as well, uh, and he's been a photojournalist for eight years, and he's passionate about long-form documentaries as well as cultural and environmental stories, especially in the Southeast Asian region. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Dylan. So, leading off of Kevin's coverage of the migrant workers in hospitals and frontline uh, healthcare workers, we also managed to access uh, dormitories during the pre-circuit breaker period and during the circuit breaker period. So um, I managed to have the opportunity to shoot uh, a dormitory right before circuit breaker when there weren't any clusters found in the major dormitories. Mm. So looking back, this image is, is quite surreal yeah. for this time la, because you see all the workers uh, gathering around uh, the common area <coughs> and listening to instructions from the Migrant Workers Centre who was doing an outreach program of what to expect during the pandemic if the pandemic reaches our shores. Mm and stuff that they should avoid and stuff they should do to keep, uh, to keep healthy. So, um, and this was th the time when 
mask wasn't mandatory yet. So you could see the residents uh, walking about the dormitories without mask on and there were even screens showing oh, how to properly put on a mask because I think many people, even even other Singaporeans, mm. weren't really sure how to put on the mask in a proper way, so like under the nose and all that. Yeah. Right? So yeah, and they were still lining up to collect their 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 packs of uh, stuff to help them with to keep healthy, and you know they they still hadn't wear their. Not everyone was wearing a mask yet. So, of course, during this period, access was understandably difficult when it came to requesting entry into dormitories and all that. But thankfully, we managed to get a couple of uh, chances. Uh, and these chances mostly came under a ministry. So it's usually the Ministry of Manpower who organise these kind of things. But because there's also a lot of different uh, agencies who are also in charge of different areas of the dormitory, so it, it is quite difficult uh, to convince them sometimes to, to what we want to shoot. Mm. So um, during the circuit breaker, we managed to go to three dormitories, uh, those gazetted ones and those non-gazetted ones. So like how Xiaoping and Kevin were in the hospitals, we also had to put on PPE uh, and take the, the full thing. Right? Yeah, the same measures. Um, and okay, so for instance, uh, this photo of um, uh, this resident at a, at the dormitory in the west, he's he's he was exercising on the stairwell. But and many times during this uh, pandemic, whenever we gain entry into dormitories, of course, it is the the coverage is very restricted by the agency who's bringing us in because obviously they want us to see the stuff that they want to show la. So this this moment was kind of like uh, he was just doing his thing and they didn't tell us of, of this. So but so I think covering the pandemic was also trying to make the best out of chances that we uh, chanced upon uh, and stuff which was not prearranged, right? And so besides that we also um, you know, managed to see swap testing for the first time, uh, which was also something which was not uh, cleared at first, but we, we as in the, the entire media kind of group was, we had to on the spot convince them to let us take it because we did not have any footage of swap testing so far. So of, of course with the correct protocols, we managed to shoot from afar. Yeah. So, and then we also managed to go to uh, a dorm in the east, which was a gazetted dorm, uh, where where workers were collecting their food, obviously uh, in a socially distanced manner. And then, of course, the last stop of the day was to the S11 dormitory, uh, when it was not at its height of the cluster, but we managed to see scenes of workers really, really anxiously looking out of their rooms. So, in this case, obviously, we weren't allowed to gain access into the the, the dorm room itself. But we managed to get in contact uh, through other private agencies, like contacts from uh, the the workers who were staying there. We managed to interview them uh, via Zoom. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like I want to say again, like the the thing about covering the pandemic, uh, especially for like dormitories, was uh, very 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 limited access. So it was really trying to figure out how to get different pictures. Uh, and not only trying to get different pictures, but trying to get as close as possible so we could understand what was happening inside. So for, for instance, um, I shot this photo of uh, workers praying during the month of Ramadan, and it was shot from opposite a dormitory, also in the west, from a vantage point uh, from an industrial building. So my idea that day was to try to get um, workers... Actually, I, I really didn't know what to expect that day, so I went there thinking maybe I could get uh, people praying from a higher angle, you know, if they were given uh, like a, a space on the ground, but because they were designated in this in the designated levels, so this so this literally just happened in front of me, and it was, it was a good happenstance, lah. Yeah. Yeah. Right place, right right time. Yeah. <laughs> and um, besides going to the purpose-built dorms, I also managed to go to the smaller factory-converted dormitories where I followed this pastor, Pastor Samuel Stephen, who was at the time very early into the outbreak, uh, doing outreach in terms of um, uh, trying to find out the problems of 
workers staying in these lesser known dorms. So the dorms that he goes to are those in Tuas where uh, it's either really, really far out, where communication is a little bit harder and there's no central like outpost where, com where, where information is disseminated. So compared to the purpose-built dormitories, these factory converted dorms were even more chaotic. So let's say like at uh, S11 or one of the bigger dorms, they at least have someone, a, a common person at the top saying, okay, we, we can't do this, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to stay uh, within this boundary. But in the factory converted dormitories, the residents were either more worried or they didn't even know what was happening because either the stuff that they were receiving was not from uh, uh, like a reputable agency. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they would get messages saying that, oh, you know, it's it's not as bad as it seems. Lah. Or some people will receive messages saying, oh, you know, it's, it's actually uh, very, very, very bad and worse than it seems. So the pastor, what he did was he, he let me follow him for a day or two uh, from morning to night, how he goes around um, reaching out to these workers, making friends with them mm. to make sure that all their problems were, were solved. Because a lot of them, they are very worried about the government agencies because always very worried to be sent back. So for them, it's like, I'm not going to say my problems. I'm not going to say what's mm. wrong so that there's no chance that they'll send me back. Yeah. So Even if they, if they feel unwell or something, then exactly. be quiet. So what this pastor did was he kind of... Uh, made friends with them over an extended period of time so that he would gain their trust and they would tell him his problems. I mean, they would tell him their problems. And besides doing outreach like this, he would go to he would go around the West doing what he calls dormitory hunting. So he would go and hunt for the dorms really in like some far out Tuas area, right? Yeah. And make sure that that the people living there are okay. So his best find was actually I mean I mean his most like interesting find was mm. Uh, a dormitory with 40 workers who hadn't eaten properly for a week. Mm. So he managed to, uh, you know, get them in touch with an agency and, you know, and, and, and get solve the problem. Yeah. So this was one of the other interesting stories la, during this mm. period. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks so much, Mark. Uh, I think, uh, wow, I, especially that last story, I think uh, uh, it's just something, I mean, it's just so sad to think about it, you know, it's like a, uh, uh, not getting enough food and like you said even they are already under pressure you know from uh, from being worried that they'll mm. be sent back or if they will contract the virus but anyway now let's move on to uh, our last panelist uh, Benjamin now Benjamin you know I understand that you were part of a team uh, who were um, who did the drone video uh, titled uh, city at a standstill could you tell us a bit about that okay so the idea of using a drone was to give a different perspective like to the scale of antennas, you know, how a city like Singapore, which never sleep, uh, come to a standstill, you know, which was very difficult to see in from uh, pictures on the ground. So if you look at the video, uh, there's a timeline that we put to it. So we flew at a specific uh, time and day where the area was supposed to be bustling with uh, people and activity. So this was over uh, PIE, Kim Kiet. Uh, so usually at that time, at about 10, 8, 8.30 to 9.30 around that area. You know, basically, these, these, these are places where it will be packed with uh, vehicles. Then next will be the pool closure. So during that, that period, uh, all public uh, pool, gym is being closed. Uh, nobody could use it. Uh, next, we went to uh, uh, Raffles Place, uh, Central Business District. So usually at uh, this area, right, People, uh, all your workers during lunchtime, they will pack um, their lunch and sit around. But when we were there during that, that time, uh, basically you only see uh, delivery workers there, you know, delivering food to those workers. Uh, mm. I mean, people can't eat outside. Lah. Basically, eateries are, you know, it's open, but you can't, you can't eat in. Then another area that we went was uh, Orchard Road on the weekend. So basically, it was a it was a ghost town. So like nobody were there. There's only like uh, me and Mark and a couple of guys jogging around. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, we went to Malayan Park on a Saturday also at about five. Mm -hmm. uh, usually packed with tourists, but you know it's also empty because you know travel has come to a standstill and no tourists could come in. Mm. Then the last one was a uh, nightlife. Uh, we were at uh, Book Key and Clark Key. So this scene was shot at about 7.30 oh, wow. in the evening at 
yeah, on the Saturday night. Mm. So when we were there, same, there were like me, Mark, then a couple of, uh, maybe you can count a handful, like five people sitting around. So this was the most memorable scene for me because when we took off, you could, on a normal day, you won't be able to hear the drone when it's up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that night we could hear the drone even if it was like 60, 60 meter up in the air. So I turn around and tell Mark, wow, this is this, you know, it's, it's really surreal to see Singapore at, at being so quiet and you know, come to a standstill. So um, the difficulty that we face in flying the drone, uh, basically there's not much uh, difficulty that we, we face in terms of getting permit and all, but it's more of the places that we want to fly. So there was one area that we really want to get the shot. The area shot of it was Chang Airport, which mm. we couldn't because, you know, uh, air travel has come to a standstill. So all the all the planes are being grounded there. So if you go, if you if we were to be able to fly the drone, you know, if we were to see how how this pandemic has affect air travel, yeah. Mm. Wow. Well, thank you again, uh, Ben. Now, a big, big thank you to our four panellists uh, for sharing their work with us. Uh, very, very interesting. I really love all the pictures. I was just uh, looking at all the pictures while you guys are presenting. Now, if you've been watching us from the start, you know that there is a question and answer segment at the end, and I'm glad to announce that the time is now. Now, before we get into your questions that you've sent in, you know, maybe I'll get the ball rolling a bit uh, with my own questions. Um, so, okay. Oh, well, sorry, not my own questions, but uh, questions that were already sent by the public, you know, uh, very eager to get your answers. Now, the first one we have is a question from Mr. Terry Tan. Uh, he asked, how did COVID-19 affect your photography and what were the learning lessons? Who wants to answer? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, of course, photography was affected. Um, the pandemic also became a reason for access to be denied. So that was one main difficulty that we faced throughout and um, I mean constantly um, access to um, certain locations. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of shooting, uh, no, because unless I'm wearing a PPE, um, that, that naturally gets a bit tougher mm -hmm. when, 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 when your goggles start to fog up. Yeah, um, because of, of course it affects your, your judgment. Yeah. Um, but in terms of learning um, lessons, uh, you, you, you get reminded that life is short. And, and for us, documenting with our camera actually puts meaning in, into what we do as we freeze moments in time, such as the act of a frontline worker or the expression on a mi migrant worker's face. Mm. Yeah. Usually to add to mm. one. So um, I manage home in focus. Mm. So it's something that like, features take time to produce. So. I guess I, I, like how everyone's life was disrupted, right? Regular programming for the features was disrupted because mm. the things that we were pursuing kind of thing, classes were cancelled, things were not yeah, happening. And then we were not like, and then you had, there's this unknown factor of this virus kind of thing. So you were trying like, um, so it affected regular programming in that sense. Mm. Yeah, and then on the, I think on a daily basis, like there, were, there was a period of time that photographers, we were not like, there was an editorial decision that we are not allowed into people's homes. I, I so that was the struggle. So like everyone had mm. to you know make adjustments. adjustments yeah. yeah, whether it's like <laughs> shooting outside the, their houses, you know, so mm. that you don't go in and stuff like that. And I, I guess like I think Kevin had experience with like normal places where in the past you could just walk in and mm. go. Like you know whether you want to get vantage points or not, you can't do that. Mm. Because like security is there, you yeah. can't just walk into a hotel and then say you want to go up and then try to shoot something. Need to do, need to use a uh, safe entry. <laughs> yeah, and then like s the security guards in the malls and stuff like that mm. would be like super like... Uh, On edge. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I so think there we, was we, like more yeah. than a few times he had to talk to talk them my, and try explain. To talk, e either talk my way through mm. yeah. or just walk away and, and find <laughs> alternatives. Find another place. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think one interesting thing is that we find ways to photograph our newsmaker. So we can't go into their house, right? So what we do, <laughs> stand at the gate, you know, at the door, you know, they are, and they're inside the house, and we shoot from there, you know, and instructing them. Another thing we faced was that whether, because everybody, or if, if we, everybody will be wearing their mask, so if we take everybody wearing their mask, right, you know, you, you can't identify the yeah. person, so what do, we, what do we do with that? So we, we, we come to a decision there by, 
we, we do both one with and one without and mm. and let the editors decide from there. Mm. Yeah. Mark, any learning lessons for you? Um, mostly the same as what my three colleagues explained about access and all that mm. la, and how uh, we have to kind of take certain measures. I think maybe uh, another thing we faced was kind of um, during the period we had to come up with we had to shoot like um, generic pictures of uh, things happening as kind of a I mean if we look back if we look back at this 20 years later whatever pictures we, we took or whoever took at this period will probably be uh, of historical mm, uh, archival yeah. value la. so um, it was also going out on a daily basis trying to shake things up you know to get how, how, how do I get this person in a, I mean how, how do I get this crowd wearing masks in a different angle which differs from yesterday's coverage or the day before. So I think many of our colleagues uh, were like figuring out, you know, like every day how to make things look different. Uh. So mm. that was one of the challenges, I guess. You know. mm. Okay. Okay, now let's move on to the second question. Uh, this is sent in by Miss Christine Lim. Uh, she asked, what has been the most challenging photo you've taken, both physically and emotionally amid the pandemic? I mean, I'll just start the ball rolling. <laughs> yeah. I think physically, like if you're talking about challenging, you can't beat like whatever that we went through, you can't beat whoever who's on the front line, like, you know, because if we talk about like how being in the PPE was stifling and it was fogging up and you cannot do anything and it was obstructing our vision and everything, I mean, how they are, it's their daily work for them, you know, we are not there, we are not there to like 24 seven, it's their it's basically their work, mm. so I don't think I don't I don't think we can talk about physically challenging. It's like you mm. can't measure. Up, can't yeah. measure. Yeah, up. yeah. and emotionally wise, right? I would say that what like um, that photo hasn't been taken yet. Oh, <laughs> meaning meaning the thing that like the I mean I think for photographers when it, I think the thing that we haven't been able to do was to document grief mm. and passing, mm. and then. You know, it's a very real thing. It's not that it's not about like you know we enjoy doing it, but it's it's real. Is in people have loved and lost yeah. over the you know over the past year, and and it's real. So that aspect of it, trying to document the passing and what happens to a body when it uh, when a, a pa patient passes from COVID, mm. is something that we've still been trying to get access to. Mm. Uh, so in that aspect, I think emotionally that will be emotional. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but it's not happened yet and we were still trying to knock on doors. Mm. Yeah. What about the rest of you guys? I think what, what we do on um, past assignments such as covering disasters um, or com coming into close contact with, a de with the deceased um, has prepped us for moments like that because when, when we talk about being emotional, you tend to want to draw a line so that you keep yourself in check and, and it, it allows you to retain your focus um, when you're trying to assess the situation and um, preempt certain moments, that's why I I I think for for most, if not all, photojournalists, mm -hmm. there's this switch that we more or less are able to turn on, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to keeping um, our emotions in in check. In check. Yeah. 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 Mark Ben, uh, you know what has been the most challenging photo you've taken during COVID? Mm, maybe. If maybe you're talking about emotions. Maybe I cannot pinpoint a, a particular picture, but uh, maybe an experience, la. So when we did the, when we went to the dorms to shoot, um, of course we were very far in certain like. So for example, we went to S11 dorm to shoot, but because it was a major cluster and it was not fully cleared, so we would have to be from a distance, la. Yeah. But uh, witnessing the the scene there was quite. Uh, emotional in a sense la, because although we are at a distance uh, and it's like they, they they aren't actually supposed to come out of their room at certain times so when they came out because they saw uh, a media bunch there mm. of, obviously curious right so they, they came out and they were quite confused quite anxious and they had been inside for almost a month and a half already oh, wow. yeah so I wouldn't say the picture but the experience was quite emotional la, yeah mm. just to see that that scene yeah. yeah. Mm. I think for, for me, uh, I, I mean, I don't go out and shoot that much because I'm on the desk most of the time. Um, I think 
by because you, before we go out for this drone shoot, right? Mm. Like most of most of us will be working from from home. So that particular day, then we we went out. Uh, after so long, we went up to Malayan together with Mark. So that was something that hit hit me was that this is happening in Singapore is real, you see. So yeah, you 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 don't think this will ever be affecting our life in such a way, yeah. So so that's one of things that hit me. Mm. I think to to sum up and and to answer Christine's question again, I think. We can't really pinpoint like to a certain photo because this has been a very um, enriching experience. experience <laughs> yeah. You know, when you talk about 2020 a as a whole, mm. so uh, we would generally want, want to talk about this as an overall experience because every picture is a part of a jigsaw. Mm. Yeah, and we are still missing one, which is <laughs> grief. Uh. Yeah. Okay, now let's uh, move on to the third uh, question. Uh, this is from Mr. Solomon Wong. Uh, he asks, given the moments that you want to capture in news photography are often fleeting, do you often set your camera to auto? And also, is the use of Photoshop allowed or is it banned in news photography? So do you set your camera to auto? Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, it, I, I, I think maybe as Professional photographers, we don't set it to auto auto, but there's other there's other functions uh, like aperture priority or shutter shutter priority where if we are shooting fast moving events, yes, we we will, we will do that for the ease of speed, but not fully auto. Yeah, and as for the Photoshop, of course it's not banned, but there's a certain there's only a certain amount of uh, editing we can do to the picture la. So I think uh, we try to make the picture if it's edited to look as much as it was in the real in the real life scenario yeah which is like increasing details of shadows mm. or making a blown out sky not so blown out mm. yeah that, that kind of editing and and white balance yeah. okay yeah if you're talking about removing wrinkles from faces no <laughs> yeah. we can do that or like uh, if um, like there's things on the ground that you don't want to be there we cannot take it out that's mm. not allowed yeah, yeah. I think generally, I mean, um, I, I to totally uh, agree with what Mark said. Uh, but, but for me personally, I, I ne never set my um, settings to auto because that, that simply says that you know, you're leaving some, if not all, of the work to the camera. Mm. Yeah, because by, by leaving something on auto mode, you know, the camera might, might construe some, something to be um, slow enough. You know, so it goes on a very slow shutter speed. And you and you are in all likelihood you you might just end up with a very blur photo. So um, how 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 I've um, how what I usually tell people is you want to be in control of all all settings. You know you want to be in control of the speed. You want to be you know. But we, we, when we are talking about fleeting moments, when you're at a specific location, the first thing we do is to expose your camera pro properly. Yeah, wherever you are, just suss out the environment first. So that when anything happens, you're on the correct exposure mm. with the correct speed. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Now I think our next question uh, is a good one for uh, for Ben. Now, Mr. Chi C C asks, could the panel share advice on drone photography in Singapore's variable weather conditions, and whether any limitations were faced and how they were overcome? I think you touched on this a bit just now, but yeah. But maybe you could elaborate. Uh, I a think bit. Uh, drone photography when we first started there wasn't much of a restriction. You can basically fly everywhere you want, mm. and except near the airport, you know, like uh, Changi Airport. You know. So after a while, they came out, you know, everybody had been flying and it affects uh, flights in Singapore. So what they did was that they control, they come with aerial domes. Mm -hmm. So within this aerial dome, you are not able to fly in it. So for example, you can't fly within uh, five kilometers of uh, Changi Airport. So if you if you really want to see how where are the restricted areas that you can't fly as a as a registered uh, C -C C -A -S pilot, right? Yeah. Uh, there's this map called one one map dot sg. Mm. So that actually shows where are the areas marked in red that you can't fly. So maybe I break it down. How how do you get to uh, registering yourself as a certified uh, drone pilot? Mm. So uh, so the very basic, you when you want to get into this, you have to go for a course. 
you know, learn how to fly it. Then thereafter, you will take a test with uh, CAS. There will be a theory test. And of course, you, they will sh uh, you have to take the drone test whereby they test you on whether you can control the drone without GPS, basically on manual mode. Mm. Then from there, um, they will award you a certificate. That means you are able to fly. So let's say, for example, me and Mark, if you want to fly Malayan, right? We have to submit an activity permit, meaning that um, we have to sp specify uh, at which area we are going to take off, and in uh, when come to emergency, where we are going to crash the drone. <laughs> yeah. And also, there's limitation in Singapore whereby you only can fly up to uh, 60 meters, right? 60 meters, 60 meters yeah. still about 200 feet. So there's still a height limit that we can go mm. to. And in terms of Singapore weather, there's only rain. And, and sunshine. Mm. So these are the two. So usually, when we when we uh, set a date to fly, we'll check Singapore the weather. But on the day when we fly, mm. you still have to call CAS, and CAS will say, okay, the airspace is clear. Then okay, that's um, mm. then you can start flying. But what about what about you know when when after the drone takes off, you know the drone's already in the sky, mm. and then the weather suddenly changes. You know how do you cope with that? Okay, so for me and Mark, what, our, our our rule is as long as Rains, we got to stop, because mm. I mean these are electric electronics, right? Mm. So you, you really can't can uh, I mean water, of course it's not waterproof lah, but of course reserve. We we try to access <laughs> it, but if too much then yeah. And because when it rains, of course there's wind, you see. So I mean ours is you know you see on the table is that drone is pretty small, so uh, I don't think if a, a, a big gust of wind comes, mm. it can handle it. Yeah. Mm. So there's a, a lot more factors uh, to consider. To yeah. Consider. Yeah. Okay, now guys, uh, we have another question as well. Uh, this is from Mr. Chua Tian Yi. Uh, he asks, you know, I'm interested to become a photojournalist and need guidance on how to begin. Sapin, <laughs> you look like you have something <laughs> no, to no, say. No, no, Mark, Mark has to answer <laughs> that. <laughs> oh, no, okay. So Mark, how do you become a photojournalist? I think maybe instead of concentrating too much on the technical aspects of photography, which can be learned along the way, it's very important if you want to become a photojournalist, to be passionate about a uh, certain subject or story. It could be, you know, you could be someone who is interested in nature mm. or someone who has, who likes riding bicycles. And from then, it is very important to not have this mentality where you just go out and shoot anything and everything. But, you know, technical aspects you can learn along the way and your style can be, uh, it will slowly come. But I, yeah, for me, I think it's very important to find a subject that you're very interested about and invest your time in it properly and and, and go completely into that. Um, mm, dive deep yeah, into, correct, into it. Exactly. Yeah. So been, Kevin, Kevin, any advice? Maybe to be a to be a photojournalist in in, in a newspaper, you really have to be interested in the current affairs in Singapore. Mm. So being a, a photojournalist in Singapore. For me personally, you know, every day I wake up, I'll see the local paper, local paper. I'll surf the net, and see what's going on in Singapore. Uh, I mean, just be capable, lah. Seriously, you know. Um, secondly, uh, as a photojournalist in the newspaper, basically our hours are very long. Mm. Right, we are on call almost 24 hours. Yeah, so it's really you got to really have the passion to 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 be a photo a journalist. Yeah. I think when the mm. question came up, I think the first thing in our minds was like, Mr. Chua, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so like like what he said, there's like there's pros and cons to every job, right? So I think you I think when people say they want to be photojournalism, you need to know whether you're prepared for the ir irregularities yeah. mm. of it. I think there's like if if you have to enjoy the unpredictability of the job, mm. I mean I think that's what we love about mm. our job and the fact that yeah. it's not the same. It's not nine to five, mm. uh, yeah. And then you get thrown into different kind of situations, and the fact that you meet different kind of people. Mm. So it's something that you have to enjoy, including like the heavy gear, <laughs> the back pains, yeah. and then putting yourself into like I mean, making calculated risks and wherever you are, whether you're abroad or local, you know, like yeah. I'm sure that everybody has interesting stories of like danger situations that mm. they've been in. And then things that we would rather not uh, let our parents know. <laughs> so I think you need to be ready for that first. Mm. And then, like uh, obviously, like what Mark said, have your own passion 
What yeah. kind of uh, secrets are you are you hiding? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Not let your parents know. I was once on top yeah. of a building. I was trying to shoot like opposite like solar panels, and yeah. then the building was just there was no. It was just the top of a building, and there was no railing. And uh -huh. it was very windy and it was very scary. I'm scared of heights. Mm. So it's like a situation where, and I was the only one there. So it's so quite stupid. Yeah, you don't have somebody looking out for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there. it's the kind of situation where like, ew, bye bye. So it, it actually a lot of split second decision you have to make when, especially when you're overseas. You know, whether should I, should I go into the crowd, for example, you know, should I go in or should I not? Mm. So it's like, at, within that second, you have to, have to decide, you know, yeah. I mean, if manners maketh men, then situation <laughs> maketh photojournalist. Wow. I mean, but, but at, at the end of the day, we, I think to a certain extent, we are all very thick-skinned. Mm. Um, uh, we shouldn't take no for an answer, mm. especially mm. when um, we are told, to, oh, you cannot shoot here. I mean, then tell, tell me, let's assess the boundaries. Yeah. If I can't shoot here, then can I shoot from across the building? Yeah. If you don't want me here, can I be there? And so you constantly have to think on your feet mm. and assess the situation. But I guess for Mr. Chua, I mean, for a start, like, like what Mark said, um, I mean, just ask yourself what you're interested in. Hit the streets, you know, hone your communication skills, talk to people, you know, delve deep. You might find a story that's mm. worth pursuing and that can re reward you in terms of visuals. Mm, yeah. That's very good advice. Well, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Now, okay, we have another question here. Um, it's from uh, Mr. Richard Koh. Uh, he asked, a bit related to um, the auto question that we had just now, uh, what camera settings do you guys commonly use to capture different poses and compositions? So maybe it can be a bit technical, you know. Well, I think the summary is it really depends on the situation and the assignment that you're on. Like if you're shooting a portrait, it will be different from you're shooting like a, like a uh, event, mm. or like it will be different from you're shooting a sport. So your settings will be tuned according to the situation mm. that you're in, and like yeah. So yeah. I mean it's like very hard. Like I can this can be a thought whole day one. <laughs> yeah, I mean <laughs> Richard, do you want to see the background? <laughs> if you want to see the background, we go on a larger aperture so that. You know, you get your bouquet, mm. your background's blur, right? And if you're in a new situation, you want, you want to go on a slightly tight, tighter aperture so that you capture a lot more details. Yeah, I mean, there's no hard and fast way of doing it. it it's all very situational, which was why I said, mm. I mean, situations really make us photojournalists. <laughs> Actually, it's good that you guys bring up this uh, situation thing. So our next question, you know, Mr. C.T. Tang uh, wants to know, how do you cover a press conference in an interesting way? So I guess, you know, press conferences uh, generally, I mean, the stereotype is that they're a bit boring, right? So how do you capture uh, you know, a different angle or different perspective? Mark, um, any tips? <laughs> I guess, okay, so we have our bread and butter shots, right? Mm. That's what we... So maybe we are trained to, uh, so maybe my practice will be if we, we have a half an hour press conference with four different people speaking. So okay, maybe one person will take about 10 minutes. So I'll make sure I get my bread and butter shots, lah, which is maybe a tight crop of the face, one from the side. How to get different shots? I guess you, in terms of what we do, you also don't want to get an overly arty image because then it doesn't make sense, mm. right? If you get a slow shot of, a slow blur shot, it, 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 it won't be used and no one will like it. So I think uh, if you talk about difference, I would think difference in expression. So if, let's say it's a press conference about, uh, it could be a, someone like maybe a company apologizing on behalf of a certain employee, that kind of thing. So maybe things you want to look out for are, are they going to bow? Are they going to be shaking someone's hand? Because that's something the PR person may not tell you. Mm. So these kind of things in different situations, you need to predict. So in terms of difference, I wouldn't say too much getting, not, not so much getting the arty, arty stuff, you know, like shooting through a camera, like another video camera, mm. or shooting through people, but more of maybe uh, looking out for those things that uh, are either not expected or the PR person is not going to tell you that it's going to happen. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Offbeat moments, mm. yeah, I think mm. you try to, that's yeah. what. Yeah, people Yeah, Okay, um, you know, on that note, um, I see a lot of cameras uh, over here on display on the table. Um, so our next question is uh, from an anonymous reader. He asks, uh, what kind of equipment do you guys use? 
So maybe you could share, you know, different. We are given. Okay, so like we are given a common kit, right? We can see here. Mm. This is a common kit, right? Yeah. Uh, and usually we're given issued three lenses. One, uh, a long lens like this, and maybe a shorter mm. lens. A mid like range. That. Uh, yeah, you can pick it up. No worries. Yeah. 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 Now of course you have your, of course you have your other longer lenses like this, mm. uh, for sports or shooting from very far places, lah. But I think maybe some of us now. So for for example, for me, I I, I. I'm using a smaller camera mm -hmm. from our equipment cabinet. That's a, something that I can shoot more indiscreetly with. Um, so maybe it depends on what kind of equipment you use. Also depends on the situation we're in, mm -hmm. So if I'm going to be shooting on an MRT or somewhere where it's, where it's uh, very, very, very discreet, then I might just use a handphone. But mm. I mean, mostly we, of course, try to use the camera itself, la. So mm. it really depends on the situation we yeah. are in. Yeah. Like for example, when, when I was shooting in uh, Ng Teng Fong General Hospital, mm. um, I knew that I'm, I'm going to be operating in close quarters. So there, there was no need for you know, ma many lenses. Mm. So I, I went for a lens that, that, that has a good coverage, um, such as the 2470. It's a mid-range lens, um, wide enough and can go tight enough. Um, and also the other consideration back then was to also avoid uh, unnecessary contamination you know, by the changing of lens and all. Mm. Yeah, so during that period, I stuck to one lens. Mm. Yeah, but, like, uh, but like what Mark said, it's very situational. Mm. I mean, on average, I mean, we're all issued a DSLR body and three lenses and a flash unit. Mm. That, that's the standard equipment. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of you know, um, sticking to one lens, uh, Ms. Carol Ang also asks, um, if you had to choose one lens out for an assignment, which would it be? I, I assume she means if you can only bring one lens for all events and all assignments. You know, what is your go-to um, equipment that you would bring? I think it would be the mid-range 2470. Yeah, I mm. shoot mainly with it nowadays since I handle features. But then the thing is, like, like if you're out and about kind of thing, mm. when it comes to news, sometimes you really need your 7200. So, but then if you had to really choose, and then if. I mean, I happen to do features quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So 2470, the mid-range, it covers something that's wide enough. You know, you want to shoot interior, you can. If you want to zoom in a little bit, you can. Mm. Yeah. Same, I think 2470. Uh. Mm. Most yeah, versatile mid -range, lens. Mid mid-range lens. Mm. So you're not too tight, but not too wide. Mm. Mm. Same for you, Ben. Yeah, Kevin. Mm. Same for you guys. Mm. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, to our four panelists over here. Of course, uh, we have Ben. Mark, Kevin and Xiaobin and there you have it ladies and gentlemen we've come to the end of the Through the Lens webinar thanks so much for all your questions and of course a round of applause for our four panellists today and on that note if you'd like to check out the photography exhibition in person there's still plenty of time you can head down to the National Museum of Singapore from now until the 7th of February and admission is free now this and others are some of the memorable images of 2020 which will be on show at the National Museum of Singapore at Through the Lens a photography exhibition jointly organised by The Straits Times and World Press Photo now Okay, and uh, I think once again, you know, um, thank our four panelists uh, so much uh, for joining us for the webinar. I hope uh, our audience finds you know the Q and A session very informative and very helpful. And uh, well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dylan Ang. Till next time.